Hey, what's up? I'm Mr. Hodge, and welcome to my flipped classroom. Today, we're talking about the physical world around us and three things that influence how people live in different areas. We'll be discussing weather and climate, environments, and resources. We'll start with weather and climate, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Get it? Get weather? You like it or not? Because I said we're going to talk about weather. Mr. Hines, cheesy jokes. Mr. Hines, cheesy jokes. Cheesy jokes. Uh, anyway, weather and climate are actually two very different things that we often lump together unfairly. It's sort of like saying legally blonde and legally blonde to red, white, and blonde are the same thing. They're not. One is a fantastic movie, and the other one is a terrible, terrible sequel that should never be seen by anyone. Mr. Hodge's bad analogy. Mr. Hodge's bad analogy. Bad analogy. Weather is the short term changes in the air for a given place and time. The key is short term. Weather changes on a day to day basis or even hour to hour, or minute to minute. Climate takes the average weather for an area over a longer period of time. To give us an idea of the difference, let's use Wisconsin as an example, since it's home and familiar to most of us. So, Wisconsin's weather is cold in the winter. Is the incorrect way to say it because weather is short term. I said winter, which means we're looking for climate long term averages. Ha ha ha, fooled you. It's okay if you got fooled. The thing is that weather is not cold in the winter because one day in December it could be 21 degrees and sunny, then the next day it could be 40 degrees and the snow could be melting, and then the next day it could be negative 50 and there could be a blizzard. Weather changes every single day. Now generally the climate for that time period would be cold, yes. Thematic maps called climate maps can be very helpful in showing us which areas have different climates. Generally, we can divide the world into five different categories of climate. We have tropical, dry, temperate, polar, and highland. These five climate categories create very different environments or natural surroundings. And going hand in hand with that, they create a variety of ecosystems where various groups of plants and animals depend on each other for survival. To determine the difference in these climate zones, we look at what kind of temperature or how warm or cold an area is, as well as how much precipitation or how much rain, snow, sleet, or hail an area gets. By knowing these two factors, we can determine what kind of environment is created there for the living things. Let's start with tropical. Tropical is generally warm and wet, and it's found mostly near the equator. Tropical climates support abundant plant life and animal life because typically this climate is very good for many plants and animals to live with. Plants and animals need water to survive, and there is usually plenty to go around in tropical climates. A dry climate receives very little precipitation, such as a desert. One important thing to remember, though, is that deserts are not necessarily warm. Certain plants and animals are well suited for dry climates, though, mostly by retaining moisture, so they don't need a lot of water where they live because they can hold on to it. Temperate climates are like the Goldilocks of climate zones. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. It's not too wet, it's not too dry, it's just right. Consequently, lots of humans live in temperate climate zones because we have the same appreciation for things being just right as Goldilocks did. Where can we find a temperate climate zone, you ask? How about, um, right here in Wisconsin? That's right, we are in a temperate climate zone. So if you think about temperate climate zones, think where you live. Polar climates can get enough precipitation to support plant and animal life, but it's still a pretty harsh climate to live in due to the incredibly cold environment it creates. Only plants and animals that can take the cold will make this environment their home. An obvious animal to use as an example for polar climates would be polar bears. 
see what they did there. Polar climate, polar bear. Right, you get the picture. Finally, the wild card of the climate zones. Time for the wild card. The highland climate. This climate zone is typically found in very tall mountain ranges and actually it's kind of a combination of many different climate zones because as you get higher in altitude, temperature and precipitation will change quite a bit. Therefore, the environment for plants and animals change throughout the highland climate as well. When we talk about South America, we'll learn all about the details of how this happens, and you'll know much greater. But for now, just know that highland climates kind of have everything in it, all jumbled together. With all these different climate zones creating different environments, we often see a different set of natural resources in various areas around the world as well. Natural resources are materials in nature that people use and value. And there are two very different types of natural resources that you should know about. Renewable and non-renewable resources. Renewable resources are naturally replaced or renewed by the earth. If a tree is cut down, we can plant another one in its place. If people drink fresh water, the water cycle will just renew itself. If you eat a hamburger from a cow, more cows will be born and we will never have to worry about McDonald's going out of business. Ever. Seriously. They won't. Non-renewable resources, on the other hand, cannot be replaced. And once they're gone, they are gone, baby, gone. Many non-renewable resources are used as energy to power our man-made machinery, sadly. Coal and oil have formed over millions and millions of years underneath the Earth's surface, and once humans started extracting it for its use, it does not replace itself. Now, resources will be a huge theme in this class, and you'll find out that often the more resources a country has, the wealthier it can get, and the better off their people tend to be. In fact, recent history is almost like a contest of sorts to see who can collect the most resources and therefore become the wealthiest. The U.S. has done pretty well in this contest, considering that we have a lot of things that humans want and need, like coal and oil, water, timber, sunlight, farmland, etc., etc. These resources help us become very wealthy. Other countries, however, have not been so fortunate, and the imbalance in resources causes people in the U.S. to live differently than the people in those other countries. Even within the United States, we can see a difference in what kind of resources are there, and in turn, the difference in how people live. So throughout the rest of the class, I really challenge you to keep the climate, environment, and the natural resources in mind when you're examining an area. They can definitely tell you a lot about how people will live there and also potentially how wealthy or poor that area is based on the resources. It might give you a hint at what kind of animals there, what kind of relationship nature has with the human inhabitants. So go study. And until next time, bye-bye.